Did you guys know that you can actually completely demolish the London system by using this somewhat strange looking move, Queen to E8? Just look at this. Imagine white plays something natural, like castle or H3. Well, let me introduce you to what may be the most uh, respectful way to kick your opponent in the nuts. We're playing the move E5. And now it will take him around like 3 seconds to realize that it's too late, since when you move the bishop, you don't really have a choice but to allow e4, since everything is defending and now you're simply gonna be winning a piece. But Alex Banzea, the London system is so 2007, nobody really plays it anymore. What should we do against the Zemish? Uh, let me show you this trap, because I promise this one's actually gonna blow your mind. It starts with castle, what goes bishop e3, and now my favorite sneaky move is to go e6, preparing to meet queen d2 with knight to c6. Now, most of the white players are gonna go knight to e2, simply because the knight does not have the natural square. And here you can go for the sneakiest idea in history, by playing the move knight a5. Look at that, targeting the pawn. They will either defend uh, with knight to g3 or b3. They both work out the same. And now it's where it begins. You can go pawn to b5. Looks like we are just plundering a pawn. But all of a sudden, after knight takes, feel free to pause the video and find the winning move. Black can actually win with knight takes on b3, exploiting the beautiful pin along the uh, a file. Winning the rope. So we're gonna be discussing about these lines in the first games and then I'm gonna be walking you through more of like a weird setup. Because if you're a low rated guy, you probably know by now that uh, they don't play theory very often. So I'm gonna show you how to play uh, King's Indian based on some general rules that should help you to never run out of ideas even though uh, your opponent may be doing uh, absolute bullshit. So let's not waste any more time and jump right into the games. All right, everybody, opponent plays uh, the e4. This is exciting. Now, what are the odds that uh, he plays d4 and doesn't go for a London system? Well, I would say pretty high considering that he played c4 already. <clears throat> Gonna be going for um, King's Indian, Bishop to g7. Now, I'm just gonna throw it uh, out there, okay? Have you guys ever considered playing the Grunfeld, which is the move d5? Main idea being that after c, d, knight, d5, e4, we get a more, like, let's say, dynamic game based on bishop g7, c5. Would you ever want, like, a video about that? I don't know. Let me know in the comments, because I've been kind of thinking about it. People say it's a lot of theory, but I think for beginners, you can get away with less and make white pretty uncomfortable. So, um... Yeah, I'm gonna go bishop g7 for now though, uh, sticking with our weapons, going for the king's indian, playing d6 on the next move, and then castling. Pretty much. Uh, most of the times. So it's important, I think d6 is the most flexible before you castle uh, as a king's indian player, so that is what uh, we're gonna go for. Just because in some variations, for instance on bishop g5, you may wanna target that bishop, so... Uh, you don't have to like rush with castle. So e4, main position on the board, d6, uh, now white has a crossroads. And he chooses the Zemish. Okay, he plays f3. Now, essentially what you need to know is that against the Zemish, going for e5 is no longer that good. So problem with e5 is that white has kind of like an easy way to go d5. And basically this setup is kind of like a pretty big counter because if you think about it what is the main idea in the king's indian right so you want to basically go 98 f5 well because they have played with f3 white quite often will be in time to meet 98 with stuff like g4 and the problem is that uh, f5 is no longer that good because of gf5 and the g file opens up to your king so Against the Zemish, you'll have to come up with a different plan. So, uh, there are many ways to deal with this. I used to play uh, the Benoni, like the big old main line, go c5, because the pawn sack uh, is completely viable. 
what it's not even supposed to take there. But more recently, I stumbled into this line, which is a6, and then I'm going to play knight c6. I think this is kind of like the one of the best lines that you can play right now uh, in terms of uh, objectiveness and also trickiness. Um, also alternative here, you can try c6, b5. I played that quite a lot over the board uh, with uh, very decent success, but I'm going to play knight c6. And the idea is that on knight e2, we have a very annoying move for white, which is the weird knight a5 attacking this pawn. However, he goes for castle. Okay. All right. So this is basically the kind of player that, uh, you know, is just like a bull. He just wants to uh, castle long, go bishop h6, h4, h5. That is what he thinks um, playing the Zemish is all about. Which, spoiler alert, it is not true. Uh, okay, the Zemish can be aggressive, but a lot of times uh, ends up being more positional. So, castling long, I don't think it's the best. Now, we have basically two moves to choose from. Either the... Uh, sneaky b5, trying to sacrifice a pawn to open up the rook, or the more solid e5, which I think I'm gonna go for. And I'm not afraid of the end game, the end game is fine. And on d5, now it is your turn to pause the video. Where would you like to go with the knight? Do you go to e7? Do you go to b8? Do you go to a5? Do you go to b4? Do you go to d4? All right, there is one move that I think it's by far the best. So very important that uh, you learn this idea. And for every King's Indian uh, starter player, knight d4. You should be able to find this kind of uh, positional sacrifices uh, in a blink. Okay, he's going to take. He's going for it. He doesn't uh, trust me. And okay, that is the main position to discuss. After the game, I'm going to show you uh, how things would have developed in case he was not uh, accepting. Now we have options. So, first things first. Uh, initially, I thought knight g4 is the way to go. Attacking the queen uh, on the discovery and uh, threatening knight f2. But let's say even if you don't have a direct uh, move to punish white, this is great in the long run because your bishop is very strong. So... Even a move like b5 now could be very strong, just opening up the queen side. But I want to check whether there is direct win already. Knight g4, queen d2. I first saw bishop h6, yeah, trying to win the queen. But then there is f4, so it's not as simple. Also, rook e8 is interesting with knight e4 idea, but he will just sidestep. I guess queen back to d2. So for this reason... You know, if b5, sometimes he will want to go c5, which now is not so great because of knight d7 double attack. So I think this is perhaps a great time to play b5. And both c5 or e5 are bad in view of knight d7. So I think this is perfect timing to play b5. Uh, okay, this is... Man, if we get some attack, this is just gonna be so instructive. I'm loving it. Queen to e3. Okay. He tries to dodge that. Um... I can play b4, I can also take, just opening up uh, the b file. I can also play rook e8, saying hello to this queen. He may be looking to play c5. I can also play knight d7, man. So many moves. I think knight d7 is kind of like part of the plan, just opening up the bishop path. Also, the knight can be useful uh, on the queen side, so I'm just going to go knight d7. Okay, he plays king b1. Now... I can take immediately or I can play rook b8. I'm not sure which one is better. The difference being that if I start with takes, there will be bishop b3. But now I will have knight c5. So I'm liking this. This is pretty nice. I'm going to take and I just want to get uh, in contact with his king. Look at this amazing bishop. Can you imagine that we only sacrificed a single pawn to have all this fun? Man, that is crazy. That is just crazy. Okay, h4. Uh, well, even if I give him three tempis, he's not going to get any attack. But, um, yeah, just letting you know to not be afraid of it. Okay, how do we get the attack? 
if I could teleport my queen onto the B file or on A5 square, that would be amazing. The problem is if I go C5, there is Ampasson. Or is that a problem? Is that a problem? Then I can go maybe knight c5? Nah, it's just like way too unnecessary to sack like that. Although, who doesn't like an unsound <laughs> sacrifice from time to time? I do like an unsound sacrifice from time to time. Okay, can I play rook b4? Targeting the bishop. If bishop b3, knight c5 is good. And what is he going with the bishop? Is he going back home? I don't know. I think rook b4 looks good. Just because uh, he doesn't seem to have a nice way to defend. I think it's a nice move to begin with. It could potentially make our next few moves uh, more straightforward, let's say. That's what I like about rook b4. Okay, bishop b3, now knight c5 is the problem for him. I'm threatening to take the bishop and win a pawn. And his king is going to be weak after that, which is really even uh, the bigger problem. I think if I was white here, I'd probably try knight e2, just sacrifice the pawn and then get some activity with knight e4. Okay, there he goes, uh, correctly assessed uh, that. But I don't have to like really rush with taking uh, there. I can start with bishop d7. The main reason is, um, yeah, maybe I don't want to see knight d4 with a tempo, so... I could just play this, making room for queen b8. Yeah, this is even uh, nicer. And yet again, this is really not going anywhere. And I can just literally play queen b8, queen b7, rook b8, and then I'm going to kill him on the b file. Just watch. Just watch. Okay, I I'm taking with the h pawn. As long as you have the fianchiero bishop and he has no uh, dart square bishop to trade it off. Uh, you're never gonna be in danger and uh, okay, so he goes knight c1 basically defending interesting, uh, the problem is uh, That is just uh, not gonna solve the issue I'm gonna have way too much power here and the final break will be uh, a5 a4 Look at that Yeah, knight c1, the kind of move that's trying to keep things together, but it's just like uh, trying to, uh, yeah, fix uh, <laughs> a broken bottle of water with some tape. That is not really gonna hold for long. Uh, I'm gonna go rook p8. To be honest, I could even uh, get started with this pawn push because he cannot take due to rook b2. And. The thing is, if I double up, he could also ignore my pawn when it gets there. So I may want to keep option to bring the rook directly to the A file. So I can go A, B and then just mate on the A file. Yeah, I can give him uh, all the time in the world. Like, can play G4, Queen there, Queen H2. It's only one check. He genuinely has no follow up. That's how important this bishop is, not only as a defensive piece, but also like a huge attacker. And remember, this bishop is just having such a good life for only a single pawn. Yeah, so. If you want to become, uh, let's say, a successful King's Indian player, you need to start and embrace this kind of uh, idea of sacrificing a pawn for activity. Hope you like this kind of game. Because I'm loving it. Okay, can I play rook b8? Yeah, rook b8 already actually threatening uh, rook b3 because it's not only gonna be a threat of uh, oh, f5 that's uh, creating a lot of holes there um, but yeah, I was saying this may work right away because not only threatening mate on b2 but just like threatening to take on c3 as well because of the pin so you'll see what I mean in a second yeah, there's gonna be queen b2 and in case, uh, yeah, like he plays rook d2 I can just take, whoops Bishop does not move like that. Probably know it. Okay, this. So, I'm gonna have uh, basically two pieces for the rook, but the end games are like uh, completely crashing. I don't even have to enter end games, but I could. Yeah, this is the big threat. He's gonna play rook d2, probably. I would imagine. And then. Uh, 
Yeah, rook d2, queen takes. Let's just imagine we go down that rabbit hole. Okay, rook c2, bishop e5. So he cannot take on c7 because that would allow rook b2 and then I guess his king is going to be mated somehow. And if he doesn't play it, then uh, I will be having just simple ideas to activate further. Yeah, so okay, queen c3. Does it make sense to take with a bishop? He may try queen h6, but I mean I can just play bishop g7, he checks me, he takes on g6. I mean, that has no threat, but... Uh, so I don't. <laughs> so am I not threatening anything? Okay, I'm just gonna go for endgame. Man, I really wish there was like a quick mate. I could also just pause and take. But I wanna like cash in some material. We have to play it safe and I have a minute left on the clock. Yeah, bishop e5. So as I was saying, this is rook b2 and also I'm threatening this, so Endgame should be completely winning with the bishop there. Question mark. Uh, yeah. There's nothing that uh, he can really play for. King c1. No. Bishop b5. Simple. I can also do that if I want to. Hmm. Wait. So bishop b5, fg, fg. Maybe I'm kind of like underestimating the danger in that position. Maybe that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I might be underestimating the danger, but we'll see. It's kind of a big pity <laughs> if uh, there's going to be uh, too much counterplay. For now, I feel like we should be okay. The bishops are uh, usually enough to cover the board, plus I have simple move if I need to defend against checkmate. If we trade the rook, then it's easy. The only kind of complicated part in this kind of endgames is... Uh, whoops. <laughs> Hello there. Thank you for that. <laughs> I was about to say that the only kind of uh, tricky part in these endgames is if uh, you trade uh, one rook, if he has a passed pawn, and then it kind of complicates, but... Um, not the case here. Yeah, time to just collect and uh, I can seal his king in a mating. Oh, <laughs> double rook gambit. <laughs> there we go. Not stalemate. No stalemate. Okay. So, all in all, it may have looked a bit messy at the end, but I think this game was very solid. We'll find out. <laughs> I'm going to say we could get over 90, although I may have missed some quicker wins yeah so we got like a uh, 90 here I may have missed a stronger move at some point yeah like here uh, I play 97 which was very good here that's how you read out the knight the computer kind of wants to play b4 and then f5 and just play for compensation I wanted to mate so I opened up the file and yeah, h4 was really unnecessary. He should play knight e2. And despite being down the pawn, down uh, a pawn, uh, the position is still uh, very balanced. Usually that's a bad sign. If uh, you're down a pawn and the position is equal, you can normally uh, just easily uh, become better when you have so much compensation. And yeah, rook b4 was actually best move. Wow, rook b4 was, uh, was not an easy find here, but it felt like uh, it should be good to include knight c5. And then, uh, yeah, rook b3, I wasn't sure. I liked this one. And then uh, I liked queen b8, knight c1, and just this uh, slowly but surely getting the pieces onto the b file, you know. Preparing the sniper, getting ready to sack. Opponent tried to desperately attack, but then rook b3 was uh, yeah, killer move. And I think the end game looked a bit complicated at the end. But I think he's completely busted. Yeah, indeed. Like bishop b5 simply. And even though it looks crazy that our king is kind of cut off like that, I was sort of debating whether he can just do this. But there is, there is like actually no threat. Like, what is he going to do next? He can just snack on this pawn. He cannot mate because the rook is going to remain undefended. And if he ever tries that, threatening rook c8, as I told you, like, there is at the very least rook here. 
And uh, well, if he doesn't uh, do anything, I can uh, easily push my jeep one down the board. So uh, that is going to be a win when he checks I have rook f8. So that was straightforward. Okay. Typical pawn sacrifice for the king's Indian. Uh, put that in your pocket. And uh, with that being said, we can just move on to the following game. All right, everybody back with another game. Gonna open it up with an knight, and hopefully we're gonna be getting a King's Indian. By the looks of it, it could also be Bishop G5 or Bishop F4, and okay, there we go. Uh, we're having the normal loan, which is something quite uh, crucial uh, to now with the black pieces, especially if you are anywhere like below 1500. Man, it's crazy how uh, popular this opening really is. I wonder who popularized it so much. Because um, like 30% of the games, they will be playing normal London. Uh, and uh, okay, my opponent is developing uh, with bishop to d3. Now, do you guys think my opponent is playing this properly so far? Well, to the untrained eye... It may look like white is doing everything normal. But what you really need to understand is that... Uh, okay, this is a very common leak, by the way, uh, that I've noticed uh, after coaching like at least 10 uh, different uh, players on the white side of the London. Everybody makes this bishop to d3. Mistake against the king's Indian. Um, okay, right, you generally want to have the bishop so you can attack. But when black is doing the fianchero, like this bishop is staring in the block of granite, it's like literally not having any pressure. More so, it will be uh, vulnerable to uh, black's main pawn break, which is e5. So after e5, there may be a fork. Now, I'm going to develop with knight bd7 and as a rule of thumb, whenever white does not uh, grab the center, and they play more of like uh, this kind of uh, system setups. We can generally rely on the double fianchero to complete development. But first, I'm going to play a tricky idea. I'm going to go not rook e8, which is also very viable, but queen e8, and I'll explain why. And this move can give you just uh, a free win. Uh, I mean, even in this rating range. It definitely uh, wins a lot of free pieces below 1500 uh, because if uh, white does not move the bishop now or plays e4, okay, good timing for white. Uh, kudos to my opponent. You see, 1800 player was able to spot my hidden idea of winning a piece. Uh, but okay, still, uh, the upcoming positions are uh, very interesting to play. The queen is doing quite fine uh, on that square. And uh, we will be finishing uh, development uh, with the fianchero. So, b6, bishop, b7, uh, in case of bishop, g5, h6. Um, yeah, just a nice little move. Hunting the bishop. And it's only a question of whether do we play g5, bishop, g3, knight, h5. Or we just do knight, h5 right away. Perhaps saving uh, the g5 move and preparing some knight f4 type of idea. It's true that also there is an argument to be made for knight c5, simply because if the bishop moves, then the e4 pawn will be hanging. Uh, notice that there is no pin. So, yeah, I quite like knight c5, to be honest. I think knight h5 is like also very interesting, but knight c5 is more concrete, and it just looks to be uh, winning the bishop pair. Which may not really seem like a lot at first, right? But considering the fact that it's a symmetrical position, any kind of little edge will really start to tell. Okay? Imagine we just... Uh, uh, you're battling a guy who basically has <laughs> the same things as you do. He's just a little bit better. There's no way you can win that fight. Same here. We will be trying to win the bishop pair and just squeeze my opponent thanks to that. Uh, okay, the bishop goes back, so he's hinting towards this pawn. Now, I can grab or I can play the move knight h5. So basically delaying the grab and hunting this bishop. I'm really inclined to go knight x and then knight h5. So basically winning both bishops. 
and then uh, go for like a little positional game. What do you guys think uh, we should be playing for? Yeah, I think that is uh, that is quite okay. I can also start knight h5, honestly. I want to keep this knight for a little bit, even though cashing in the bishop feels good. It's also sort of releasing the tension, so generally uh, if you can keep the tension, uh, the longest uh, you can usually the better. Uh, so perhaps we can delay that a little bit. Maybe make him play b4 and then I'm gonna take. Uh, okay, he keeps the bishop, interesting decision. Uh, I'm gonna take because if we try some 96, 94, uh, there's gonna be an issue with the e5 pawn. So. I think it's just uh, time to take and uh, all right how do we follow this up okay interesting opponent has decided to take with the f pawn which i kind of know what he's playing for he really wants to go some knight h4 with tactics and pressure but this is just a bad move because now he has an isolated pawn that's gonna be a long-term weakness the only question is whether we want to play c6, b5, trying to hunt the bishop this way, or we just trade. This is, uh, yeah, the biggest thing to decide. We're going to start c6. I think that's principled. Uh, and on knight h4, that's going to be threatening to take on g6. I am just going to defend with king h7. Okay, so he plays a3. He's just uh, making a square. I'm going to go b5, grabbing space. And only then on bishop a2, I think now, uh, bishop e6, it's kind of like a really uh, nice way to finish development. This rook is coming into d8, king h7. This is, um, yeah, we're just having a great position, even though, ah, that's really not a move you should be playing. Ah, look at the poor bishop. You can almost hear it screaming in pain. Oh man, the bishop is really a prisoner. Uh, the bishop is feeling uh, <laughs> like a sardine right now. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, we should not lose focus. Okay, I'm gonna go king h7. So I was about to say that we are having a great position, and despite the fact that it may not, it may not be entirely obvious how to proceed. We simply have such an amazing position because. White doesn't really have any constructive ideas, so that's usually a pretty big tell uh, that you have a great position. So I'm going to improve my queen, defend the knight, uh, also cover the square. Perhaps on a good day we can play h5, bishop h6 and just activate this bishop because it's currently a little bit restricted. And uh, with a little bit, I mean really restricted. Uh, my opponent plays c4. Further... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, further restricting this already very restricted sardine on a2. Uh, okay, he does want to take a pawn at the end of the day, so we shall respect his counterplay. Uh, does bc4 make any sense? I kind of don't want to play that because then we have an isolated pawn, so probably a6. Uh, can we just do rook ad8 though and just like sort of ignore his threat? Usually before you defend, uh, you kind of want to double check whether you can still play uh, your ideal move. Yeah, to me, it looks like we could probably sacrifice, but I'm just going to play a6 because it's simpler. Uh, the main trick that I'm uh, looking for is he'll probably play b4, trying to like open up this bishop. And then uh, where do you guys think we should go with a knight? That is going to be a big question. Because sure, there's like the simple knight back. But I think even stronger, you can play knight a4. And then if opponent goes c5, that would just be a blunder. You pause the video and tell me why. Because there are two ways to win. Either take the bishop or play knight c3 first. Which is double attack and black just wins. So he plays knight e1, which is, uh, yeah, we're very happy to see. Whenever your opponent makes a retreating move, uh, you should be happy. Retreating moves uh, are usually bad, especially when uh, you are not forced to. So I'm just going to uh, place my rook onto the open file. I am using the a rook simply because the f rook may be useful in the uh, eventual case we play f5, which is a very typical move for the king's Indian. 
my opponent decides now to take uh, we have a choice I can keep it uh, symmetrical or I can try to take with the a pawn this is kind of interesting because uh, you know having teleported my rook back on a8 I'd be more inclined to take with the a pawn but considering the fact that a b would still give him some targets maybe I'm not super sure I want to take uh, with the a pawn so I'm mainly inclining to play c takes on b5 although capturing towards the center it's always a rule to keep in mind i don't think it's like such a bad move either so yeah i'm gonna play like this avoiding uh, potential weakness and okay b4 b4 all right hitting this can i take on a2 i kind of want that because bc5 i can take intermediate move and i'm winning a pawn so we can start with that and then we have uh, a choice between a bunch of juicy moves. I can actually go knight e6, heading towards d4. That is one idea. Or I can go for the other cheeky plan of going knight a4 and then trying to get that knight over c3. The problem is that this, is, this feels more of like hope chess. So I would rather... Uh, want you to value more this uh, concept of playing for the outpost because we have the pawn that's supported and see you play solid chess you're rewarded your opponent instantly blunders it is uh, proven by this video uh, so uh, next time you want to play hope chess just uh, play solid chess and you will be uh, rewarded okay don't like shit talk me in the comments if it doesn't work you just haven't tried enough times all right i've been trying this for the last like decade come back in the comment section in a decade and we'll see if it worked or not all right unless we're conquered by ai anyways uh queen takes on c2 queen takes on c2 uh we do have uh so much extra material we have a uh, rook for a knight meaning that at this point of the game we should just look for trading pieces Indeed, checking is very tempting, but uh, you don't want to check for like, uh, you know, random reasons. So I think just because the rook is kind of inactive on f8, I'm gonna start uh, bringing it into the game. So notice how logically the rooks are coming uh, onto the open files. And uh, yeah. Oh, do I want to play rook fd8? Do I want to blunder in front of you? Not in front of you. So I am just going to play queen e6. I'm only allowed to blunder in my spare time. I'm gonna go queen e6, just offering the queen trade. Very important, okay? Yes, I am allowing double pawns, but on the other hand, uh, getting rid of the queens, uh, it's almost like uh, eliminating the only slight possibility that my opponent had to create any kind of play. So, okay, I am gonna take, I am now gonna go f5, simply trying to activate this rook, threatening to take, uh, if we can trade uh, his rook, that would make things even easier. On knight c5, that may look a little bit scary at first. But not only uh, we can sort of ignore it, or defend, or play a5. But even in some positions, um, we can consider giving back the exchange and then winning a pawn. Not here. Here I would probably just go fe and uh, yeah, go for the rook trade. Notice how uh, after he takes on a6, we will be able to win the a3 pawn at least. So yeah, taking this. Oh, he takes on e4. All right. Now notice how nicely uh, we have the situations with uh, pawns on the dark squares that uh, our bishop can uh, attack them easily. So I'm going to sacrifice a5. It's not really a sacrifice because we were winning it back by force and... Um, yeah, now that we managed to get this kind of position with uh, a passed pawn, I'll just have to not blunder my bishop. Can I do that? That seems pretty challenging. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go here, so I defend my pawn, and then I'll try to push the passer. Okay, at this point, you just wanna focus on uh, supporting this pawn and not blundering forks. That's pretty much everything we need to watch out for. What are the odds of uh, <laughs> getting kicked in the nuts by falling for a fork? When is the last time uh, that happened? I bet it never happens. Okay, we're trading. The trades are welcome. And then we're going to go B3. 
threatening b2 uh, now just uh, if i go rook b8 he's gonna blockade and it will take a bit of time so this one is uh, more efficient now preparing b2 on the next move no matter what he does and that is gonna be a queen uh, in a normal world your opponents will resign but they do want my juicy elo so they will try to flag me little do they know that uh, despite playing with the speed uh, of a grandpa i can actually speed up if i want to to some degree right king e5 will we be able to show the king and rook checkmate that's gonna be quite nice so king here, check. Okay, I'm gonna go in. I'm, I'm gonna try to get him in the mating net. So check, king g3. We may be just winning pawns. So that is that. Yeah, just winning pawns. H4 I'm gonna take. Yeah, okay. There we go, that's gonna be nice. Now you can just push and promote into a rook. If you're fancy. I am fancy. Okay. Overall, that was pretty clean. Let's just uh, pop in the game review and uh, see how atrocious computer things uh, we played. We got an 85. Huh. 85 only. Excuse me? 85? That felt like a pretty clean game. Hmm. What do you think it could have been better? Computer. Your little dumb, soulless uh, <laughs> thing. Knight c5 was okay. Knight h5 was okay. Ah, I could have played b5 right away. Ooh, I played c6 so that I'm prepping it just because I'm not used to have the queen on e8. Yeah. You see, I forgot about this. I played the queen mainly to support the e5 push. But you can also support b5, which would have been such a nice move in this position. Just because the bishop has to either go passive or to b3, where you have the option of uh, keep chasing him even further. And in case of like a3, maybe some nice development, then he can take it. The bishop's not running away. Black is just dominating. So, kind of key mistake for white. He should have uh, taken with the h-pawn. Notice that uh, he didn't end up uh, creating any pressure. And at some point after you move the knight, at least your pawns will be defending each other. So it's not that easy to break. As you can see, highlighted by the computer, black is already having a slight edge without any risk. So this is definitely a very nice position to be playing. And yeah, we kind of... Played okay overall, I feel like. B3, definitely, you shouldn't sardine your own bishop. But even if you would have been taking, I guess I would have probably taken with the queen. Then rook d8. With, uh, yeah, ideas to put pressure on both sides of the board. I was also considering something like f5 sooner or later. So, yeah. Use this little queen 8 idea. I promise it's gonna give you, like... So many free wins against the London guys simply because they just autopilot with a move like h3 and already they can resign. Okay, e5, targeting this bishop, takes takes, bishop has to move, bishop h2 and then e4. And black wins uh, thanks to the fork. Now, the key detail, please notice that the queen on e8 is important because if you do this trick with a rook, it's no longer that effective because they will have the opportunity of saving the piece with bishop to g5. Because if you go e4, they can take, and now uh, white is taking advantage of the spin, and uh, the trap no longer works that well. So for this reason, that is why queen e8 is so sneaky. And it's not like misplacing the queen. This is a very useful square for the queen. And uh, in case the trap doesn't work out, uh, you can still uh, fianchero. And then, like in the game, notice how convenient uh, it was to try and chase this bishop. You can play uh, knight h5 always uh, without having to worry about uh, the spin. So, uh, yeah. With that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Alright, everybody. Back with another game. We've got uh, Mr. Yuri Jeo here. 
starting off with D4 and then E3. I wonder is his, if uh, he's going to follow up with F4 going for the reversed uh, stone wall, but it looks like he's just playing kind of like a um, caller setup or something along uh, those lines. Um, it doesn't really matter what kind of opening he plays. However, what it matters is uh, the fact that we get to deal with, um, let's say, a more unorthodox setup. Because especially as a lower rated player that is just trying to pick up the King's Indian, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're gonna get to face a lot of these. Which, hey, for the better of it, this means that your opponent is not going for the most cutting edge theory and, um, yeah, you should be getting comfortable openings uh, most of the times. If you know, of course, uh, some ideas, which I'll try to uh, showcase uh, in these games. Uh, okay, he's spending quite a bit of time. Knight f3. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, he seems to have uh, not the best period. <laughs> a lot of red on his profile. I'm just gonna get castled and uh, I'm gonna play d6. This is pretty much the starting position for the King's Indian. And what I already want to highlight is uh, the position of his bishop. This bishop is not well placed against the king's Indian. Okay, you're not gonna be getting an attack. Uh, and black's principal uh, pawn break is to go for e5. Thus, the bishop will end up being misplaced in a lot of these variations. So, it's better for white to just play the humble bishop e2 and then uh, go for some kind of uh, queenside expansion. But, okay. All right. How do we challenge this? I think we're gonna still play uh, the simple knight bd7 as a rule of thumb where you're, when your opponent is not uh, fully grabbing the center, with that I mean he is not playing e4, uh, you can generally just rely on the double fianchero to finish development. That is a very convenient uh, way of playing. However, I'm also wondering if in this position we can just start with uh, e5 right away. That is uh, also mm, something that uh, we can play first and then uh, sort of think later. It's a very typical move and it's very nice because it comes with a tempo. It comes with a threat of playing e4. So for this reason we can delay uh, developing uh, the light squared bishop. And okay, on d5 generally we will be taking with a pawn. Trading with a knight uh, is also playable, but uh, you're not like guaranteed that he's gonna take. So the pawn is quite uh, important to control these central squares. That is why um, generally we're gonna be following uh, this recapture. And okay, he plays queen c2, uh, stopping the threat of e4. He thinks you should always double check and uh, calculate a little bit deeper. Let's try to do that. So e4, all right, he has to take. We have to take, otherwise there's no follow-up. Queen takes, and then do we have any interesting moves? There's knight f6 as a move, but then his queen can just go back. The other aggressive knight move would be to c5. This is actually more interesting because not only that it's attacking the queen, but it is also trying to take advantage of the b3 square. Notice that if the knight lands on b3, it could potentially be very annoying. So for that reason, e4 just looks like an uh, amazing pawn sacrifice to me. Just think about that. If we play knight c5, not even queen c2 will save white because there will be bishop f5 developing with a tempo. And uh, yeah, you will be just getting kind of like a winning position. However, let's say you are just getting started, okay? You cannot see shit, basically, honestly speaking. You cannot calculate so deeply. Well, then you can rely on a more uh, general idea. Like, let's say you can put your queen on uh, e7. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, you can also play rook e8, just developing, threatening to fork. And then you can also play a move like knight c5. Um, trying to hunt the enemy bishop, activating your knight, and uh, this way simply developing. It is right that maybe it would have also been interesting to play knight c5 on the previous move, but yes, he plays e4. 
stopping my idea. I'm gonna go knight c5 because even though b6 is still viable, I just like to uh, get in the pressure of uh, creating this threat of winning the bishop pair. So I'd rather start uh, with that first. Um, and okay, bishop has still options on this diagonal, while always we have the fianchiaro in the pocket. Okay, he plays b4. I'm gonna take on d3. Uh, already uh, cashing in the bishop pair is a small uh, positional victory for us. And uh, yeah, many interesting moves already. What do you guys think uh, we should be playing? You can sort of keep developing. Rook d8, uh, getting a tempo. Bishop g4, not super terrible here. b6, bishop b7, reasonable. However, I think this is the kind of position where uh, you really want to ask quite uh, some unpleasant questions by playing a5. Because a5, it's threatening to take on b4. And if he plays b5, I'm going to tell you a secret. Uh, that one is never allowed to move back, okay? This is a grandmaster secret right there. Meaning... You can actually take advantage of this outpost by going for something like knight d7, knight c5. Then if you can play a4, white is pretty much going to be uh, completely paralyzed on the queen side. And uh, we can just start uh, playing bishop e6, targeting those pawns. Uh, black is much better. We can do a little bit of analysis after the game. But on bishop to b2, I was thinking we could simply take. What is wrong with just taking? Probably nothing. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Probably nothing. Uh, okay. I can take... I can also do knight h5. Maybe a knight lands on f4. Saying hello to the enemy queen. Yeah. I think I'm just gonna go for simple. Trade rooks. Take the pawn on b4. Uh, that is pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah. Gonna be taking that pawn. I could also think about throwing in rook d8, which is actually kind of nice. Queen c3 trying to defend the pawn is not good in view of knight e4. So this is a very nice little detail. Notice that we could have gotten this position with the rook on f8, but we are just getting an extra tempo. And queen b3 saving the pawn also loses e4, so this won't help my opponent. So always, uh, yeah, keep an eye on these kind of intermediate moves. The rook to d8. It may not seem uh, like a lot in the current game, but sometimes it can make the difference between uh, having an equal position or uh, winning a piece. Uh, so definitely something to be aware of. Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. It would have been a bit worse with the Rook F8 than having it here already on the open file. And okay, opponent takes on E5, targeting this pawn. So probably just going to go for a simple move like pawn to c6, not hanging the pawn. That is usually a good idea. And after that, we could finish development. Bishop e6, targeting this pawn. Um, if opponent plays rook d1, we may trade. Yeah, I think actually we could simply trade and then notice how the pawn on e4 remains undefended. You gotta watch out for the back rancor, but I do believe that uh, the queen will be able to return to f8 just in time. So, uh, h3, just uh, creating a luft. Bishop e6, developing, as I promised, attacking the pawn. Kind of expecting him to play knight bd2. And then, uh, yeah, we could be uh, looking to maneuver with like knight d7. What else should we play for? Also, keep in mind that now rook b5 is a rook b1 is an option. So, Opponent may want to win that pawn. For instance, take takes, rook b1. We don't really have a move uh, to save the pawn on b7. Now, does it make sense to play b5? I mean, yes and no. Because it's going to be um, kind of giving us a lonely pawn. So, I would much rather play queen c5. Call me weird for that. But it feels like a good prophylactic move. Well, first of all, keeping an eye on the bishop. Second of all, pinning the spawn. Third of all, avoiding the direct through b1. And ultimately threatening b5. So, queen c5, not entirely sure about this move. It might be a little bit crazy for playing it. 
But yeah, I think he has to go queen c3, kind of defending his queen and also gaining a tempo. Notice how pretty much all the good moves in chess are the attacking moves, the moves that either attack something or clearly improve your pieces. So uh, I know at first it may look like very kind of difficult to see how everything is happening, but as you can see, I'm able to generally predict a decent chunk of my opponent's moves just because of that. So uh, yeah, expecting Queen C3 and I'll probably have to move this knight, which I wasn't really uh, planning to, but I guess simple move like knight eight or knight h5, anything that keeps the bishop defended will be good. Uh, and okay, on rook d1, he may be willing to go for some discovery, but notice how uh, if knight b3, I have rook d1, intermediate move with a check. So I'm not a, uh, not afraid of that. Uh, can I just play b5? Also, knight e4, I don't think it really works. I can just take with a queen and there's no follow-up. So just b5, following my uh, plan. Yeah, knight b3, he does that idea. Did I... Uh, miss something i may have missed something in the process okay this is actually quite interesting because i was thinking we could just go grab but then there is going to be the back rancor issue i have to play bishop f8 but then he's going to be able to uh, take on f6 question mark i mean i can take on b3 but there's going to be bishop e7 and i'm getting kind of mated mm, i don't want to get mated like that Worst case scenario, I do have queen e7 and my position is still pretty healthy. Although he's gonna be able to get some 94 unwanted activity. Yeah, I think I start with trade and then just go back with a queen. Call it a day. Um, go here. Still after cb, cb because I have the bishop pair and the uh, uh, kind of outside pass pawn, I do keep a small advantage which uh, can easily transform into a large advantage if my opponent is not careful. So, okay, CB. Now, taking this and allowing the pawn to run away can't really be a good option, so I'm just going to play the simple move recapture. Notice how I can easily keep that pawn defended with something like bishop to c4. And, uh, well, the bishop pair will really start to tell in this kind of positions. Uh, okay, if we get to see a move like bishop takes on f6 on the board, you're gonna notice how these bishops are just like so strong supporting the pawn. It is gonna be, I think, just a winning advantage. Um, it would be quite instructive because generally uh, you think that chess games tend to be won by your opponent blundering his queen, you missing it and then finding a mate. Well, in reality, just having a bishop against a knight in such endgame with a passed pawn can just lead to an easy win. You don't really need uh, that much to win a chess game. I know, kind of crazy, but uh, we are here to learn together. I'm also learning from these games, as it seems. <laughs> having a hard time against this opponent, but I think we're doing quite okay. I can push, I can play 97. The idea with knight d7 is that uh, he can trade, which is perhaps a good move. I just wonder whether we could start simply pushing. Now that his queen's no longer fanning that, I was wondering maybe queen b4, but now I think, yeah, trading this bishop, as much as I'm a bishop pair lover, I do think that getting rid of that annoying piece so that there won't be any uh, back rank threats anymore should be okay. And queen a1, so I would really love the queen trade here, but uh, I have to be careful and see whether he can try to decline that queen trade. I think that would be the best play for him. So I'm gonna go f6. I think it's a better move simply because on queen a5, I will have ideas like queen c5. I'm not going to play queen f6. Perhaps he would have exchanged, but you don't want to be playing hope chess. So I just want to keep an idea to meet queen a5 with queen c5. So then I can simply push this pawn. I can also maybe queen a5 b4, push the pawn right away. Could very well work. Yeah, maybe b4 now. Uh, b4, 94. 
And then knight c6 is annoying, so I'm going to start with the queen, just defending it. It's a bit better. Notice that, uh, yeah, he had some of that coming. And... Opponent has been playing pretty good so far. If we manage to, like, squeeze a win here, that would be something. It won't be easy, and I do believe that he should still be able to hold this position with best play. Uh, knight to b3, I can take and go queen c1, queen f4 with uh, an instant draw. I can also play queen b4. Yeah, so... There's the perpetual. That's a perpetual right there. Or is it? You can play g3. Perhaps not a perpetual yet. I'm not gonna get such an easy time with a perpetual, huh? Okay, I'm just gonna go queen trade. This is still slight edge. If he trades queens, he should definitely not be exchanging here. He should try anything like queen d1. Keep some activity. On queen d1, I'm perhaps gonna go... Knight c5. Oh, he does trade. Okay, this is gonna be interesting. He's gonna play king f1. Uh, do we just go knight e5? Oh no, he goes knight e4. Uh, interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, okay. Don't panic. Okay, knight c5, attacking the pawn. Attacking the pawn, and I'm gonna play knight b3 after. How bad can this be? Oh, just handed me the free pawn. Like an early Christmas gift. I'm gonna be taking that. Man, this is so nerve-wracking. 30 moves, no mistake. All of a sudden, he just thinks that I'm low on time and he's gonna flag me, so... He blunders a full pawn. I'll take that. Little does he know that we're gonna effortlessly convert this endgame, huh? You guys don't believe it? Don't believe it, just watch. Okay, king about to go to g3 and uh, <laughs> collect even the ancestors of those pawns. Like before chess existed. <laughs> I don't know where I was going to go with that narrative. But we are going to be taking these pawns. So, oh, trace the knights. Then, yeah, this is going to be really hopeless. Okay. Ah, it's been a long day. Yeah. Oh, never mind. We just won. Nice. Now, if you really want to learn the King's Indian, a lot of people have liked this video. That video. Go there. You want to go there? Why aren't you clicking this video?